Welcome Mitchell Mustangs. It's wonderful to be together again today as we talk about what great readers do as they read their stories and read Charlotte's Web together. So yesterday we talked about characters and it got me thinking that great readers understand why authors choose a certain point of view to craft, create, write their text. And the authors are very thoughtful and mindful about which point of view to use to serve their purpose. So we know that first person point of view, an author might choose this point of view so that the reader may see through the eyes of one character and almost walk inside this one character's shoes. And it's very important to understand that as readers, we know this one character's perspective and we are inside this character's mind and we know all of his or her thoughts and we feel very close to the character. An author might choose to use second person point of view and we see the word you to invite the reader inside of the story. So let's think about the book If You Give a Mouse a Cookie by Laura Numeroff. She uses the phrase, if you give a mouse a cookie, if you do this, and a four-year-old feels like he or she steps inside of that fun book with the mouse. So that's a fantastic option for young children to feel like they are stepping inside of a book. At our age, middle schoolers might use second person point of view inside of persuasive writing. So an author might be wanting the reader to come on board with their point of view about some sort of issue. And so the author might say, if you do this, this will happen and that's a good thing. Or if you don't do this, this will happen and that's a bad thing. So the author is trying to bring the reader inside of their issue and get them on board and support and do something to possibly move their, their issue and their belief forward. Third person point of view is where the narrator tells the story. And sometimes it's limited, meaning the narrator only tells us a limited, just like the word, amount of knowledge gives offers us a limited amount of knowledge. Whereas third person omniscient is where the narrator helps us to know what all of the characters are saying and doing, but more importantly, what they're thinking and feeling. Charlotte's Web by E.B. White that we're reading is third person omniscient. He does a phenomenal job of inviting us into the story and seeing through the narrator's eyes all the characters, what they say, what they do, most importantly, what they think and what they feel. In my opinion, this is one reason why Charlotte's Web is a classic, because we as readers really know each of the characters and I for one feel like I'm in the barn with all of these animals. So as we read today let's think about how well we get to know the characters because of the point of view of third person omniscient that E.B. White chose to use to write this beautiful story. All right so let's jump back inside of this story together. Charlotte, he said softly. Yes, Wilbur. I don't want to die. Of course you don't, said Charlotte in a comforting voice. I just love it here in the barn, said Wilbur. I love everything about this place. Of course you do, said Charlotte. We all do. The goose appeared, followed by her seven goslings. They thrust their necks out and kept up a musical whistling like a tiny trope of pipers. Wilbur listened to the sound with love in his heart. Charlotte, he said. Yes, said the spider. Were you serious when you promised you would keep them from killing me? I was never more serious in my life. I am not going to let you die, Wilbur. How are you going to save me? 
asked Wilbur, whose curiosity was very strong at this point. Well, said Charlotte vaguely, I don't really know, but I'm working on a plan. That's wonderful, said Wilbur. How is the plan coming, Charlotte? Have you gotten very far with it? Is it coming along pretty well? Wilbur was trembling again, but Charlotte was cool and collected. Oh, it's coming all right, she said lightly. The plan is still in its early stages and hasn't completely shaped up yet, but I'm working on it. When do you work on it? begged Wilbur. When I'm hanging head down at the top of my web, that's when I do all my thinking, because then all the blood is in my head. I'd be only too glad to help in any way I can. Oh, I'll work it out alone, said Charlotte. I can think better if I'm alone. All right, said Wilbur, but don't fail to let me know if there's anything I can do to help no matter how slight. Well, replied Charlotte, you must try to build yourself up. I want you to get plenty of sleep and stop worrying. Never hurry and never worry. Chew your food thoroughly and eat every bit of it, except you must leave just enough for Templeton. Gain weight and stay well. That's the way you can help. Keep fit and don't lose your nerve. Do you think you understand? Yes, I understand, said Wilbur. Go along to bed then, said Charlotte. Sleep is important. Wilbur trotted over to the darkest corner of his pen and threw himself down. He closed his eyes. In another minute, he spoke. Charlotte, he said. Yes, Wilbur. May I go out to my trough and see if I left any of my supper? I think I left just a tiny bit of mashed potatoes. Very well, said Charlotte, but I want you in bed again without delay. Wilbur started to race out to the yard. Slowly, slowly, said Charlotte. Never hurry, never worry. Wilbur checked himself and crept slowly to his trough. He found a bit of potato, chewed it carefully, swallowed it, and walked back to bed. He closed his eyes and was silent for a while. Charlotte, he said in a whisper. Yes. May I get a drink of milk? I think there are a few drops of milk left in my trough. No, the trough is dry and I want you to go to sleep. No more talking. Close your eyes and go to sleep. Wilbur shut his eyes. Fern got up from her stool and started for home, her mind full of everything she had seen and heard. Good night, Charlotte, said Wilbur. Good night, Wilbur. There was a pause. Good night, Charlotte. Good night, Wilbur. Good night. Good night. An explosion. Day after day, the spider waited, head down for an idea to come to her. Hour by hour, she sat motionless, deep in thought. Having promised Wilbur that she would save his life, she was determined to keep her promise. Charlotte was naturally patient. She knew from experience that if she waited long enough, a fly would come to her web, and she felt sure that if she thought long enough, Wilbur's problem, an idea would come to her mind. Finally, one morning, toward the middle of July, the idea came. <gasps> wow, how perfectly simple, she said to herself. The way to save Wilbur's life is to play a trick on Zuckerman. If I can fool a bug, thought Charlotte, I can surely fool a man. People are not as smart as bugs. Wilbur walked into his yard just at that moment. What are you thinking about, Charlotte? He asked. I was just thinking, said the spider, that people are very gullible. What does gullible mean? Easy to fool said Charlotte. That's a mercy, replied Wilbur, and he lay down in the shade of his fence and went fast asleep. 
The spider, however, stayed wide awake gazing affectionately at him and making plans for his future. Summer was half gone. She knew she didn't have much time. That morning, just as Wilbur fell asleep, Avery Arable wandered into the Zuckerman's front yard, followed by Fern. Avery carried a live frog in his hand. Fern had a crown of daisies in her hair. The children ran for the kitchen. Just in time for a piece of blueberry pie, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Look at my frog, said Avery, placing the frog on the drain board and holding out his hand for the pie. Take that thing out of here, said Mrs. Zuckerman. He's hot, said Fern. He's almost dead, that frog. He is not, said Avery. He lets me scratch him between the eyes. The frog jumped and landed in Mrs. Zuckerman's dishpan full of soapy water. You're getting your pie on it, said Fern. Can I look for the eggs in the hen house, Aunt Edith? Run outdoors, both you, and don't bother the hens. It's getting all over everything, shouted Fern. His pie is all over his front. Come on, frog, cried Avery. He scooped up his frog. The frog kicked, splashing soapy water onto the blueberry pie. Another crisis, groaned Fern. Let's swing in the swing, said Avery. The children ran to the barn. Mr. Zuckerman had the best swing in the county. It was a single long piece of heavy rope tied to the beam over the north doorway. At the bottom end of the rope was a fat knot to sit on. It was arranged so that you could swing without being pushed. You climbed a ladder to the hayloft. Then, holding the rope, you stood at the edge and looked down and were scared and dizzy. Then you straddled the knot so that it acted as a seat. Then you got up all your nerve and took a deep breath and jumped. For a second, you seemed to be falling to the barn floor fall below, far below. But then, suddenly, the rope would begin to catch you, and you would sail through the barn door going a mile a minute, with the wind whistling in your eyes and ears and hair. Then you would zoom upward into the sky and look up at the clouds, and the rope would twist, and you would twist and turn with the rope. Then you would drop, 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 down, down, down out of the sky and come sailing back into the barn, almost into the hayloft, then sail out again. Not quite so far this time. Then in again, not quite so high. Then out again, then in again, then out, then in. And then you jump off and fall down and let somebody else take a try. Mothers for miles around worried about the Zuckerman swing. They feared some child would fall off, but no child ever did. Children almost always hang onto things tighter than their parents think they will. Avery put the frog in his pocket and climbed to the hayloft. The last time I swang in this swing, I almost crashed into a barn swallow, he yelled. Take that frog out, cried Fern. Avery straddled the rope and jumped. He sailed out through the door, frog and all, and into the sky, frog and all. Then he sailed back into the barn. Your tongue is purple, screamed Fern. So is yours, cried Avery, sailing out again with the frog. I have hay inside my dress. It itches, called Fern. Scratch it, yelled Avery as he sailed back. It's my turn, said Fern. Jump off. Fern's got an itch, Avery sang. When he jumped off, he threw the swing up to his sister. She shut her eyes tight and she jumped. She felt the dizzy drop, then the supporting lift of the swing. When she opened her eyes, she was looking up into the blue sky and was about to fly back through the door. They took turns for an hour. When the children grew tired of swinging, they went down toward the pasture and picked wild raspberries and ate them. Their tongues turned from purple to red. Fern bit into a raspberry that had a bad tasting bug inside it and got discouraged. Avery found an empty candy box and put his frog in it. The frog seemed tired after his morning in the swing. The children walked slowly up toward the barn. They too were tired and hardly had enough energy to walk. Let's build a tree house, suggested Avery. I want to live in a tree with my frog. I'm going to visit Wilbur, Fern announced. 
They climbed the fence into the lane and walked lazily toward the pig pen. Wilbur heard them coming and got up. Avery noticed the spider web, and coming closer, he saw Charlotte. Hey, look at that big spider, he said. It's tremendous. Leave it alone, commanded Fern. You've got a frog. Isn't that enough? That's a fine spider, and I'm going to capture it, said Avery. He took the cover off the candy box. Then he picked up a stick. I'm going to knock that old spider into this box, he said. Wilbur's heart almost stopped when he saw what was going on. This might be the end of Charlotte if the boy succeeded in catching her. You stop it, Avery, cried Fern. Avery put one leg over the fence of the pig pen. He was just about to raise his stick to hit Charlotte when he lost his balance. He swayed and toppled and landed on the edge of Wilbur's trough. The trough tipped up and then came down with a splat. The goose egg was right underneath. There was a dull explosion as the egg broke and then a horrible smell. Fern screamed. Avery jumped to his feet. The air was filled with the terrible gases and smells from the rotten egg. Templeton, who had been resting in his home, scuttled away into the barn. Good night, screamed Avery. Good night. What a stink. Let's get out of here. Fern was crying. She held her nose and ran toward the house. Avery ran after her, holding his nose. Charlotte felt greatly relieved to see him go. It had been a narrow escape. Later on that morning, the animals came up from the pasture, the sheep, the lambs, the gander, the goose, and the seven goslings. There were many complaint, compliments about the, excuse me, complaints about the awful smell, and Wilbur had to tell the story over and over again of how the arable boy had tried to capture Charlotte and how the smell of the broken egg drove him away just in time. It was that rotten goose egg that saved Charlotte's life, said Wilbur. The goose was proud of her share in the adventure. I'm delighted to know that the egg never hatched, she gabbled. Templeton, of course, was miserable over the loss of his beloved egg, but he couldn't resist boasting. It pays to save things, he said in his surly voice. A rat never knows when something is going to come in handy. I never throw anything away. So I'm gonna stop for a minute here. And I'm going to look at the way that E.B. White has used third-person omniscience so well. I love when he says here, Wilbur's heart almost stopped when he saw what was going on. That might be the end of Charlotte. So we know how Wilbur feels in the moment when Avery is going after Charlotte. And then Charlotte says, it says here, Charlotte felt greatly relieved to see him go. It had been a narrow escape. And then it goes on to say the goose was proud of her share in the adventure. And then for Templeton it says, but he couldn't resist boasting. E.B. White invites us inside of this story through the narrator where we not only know what each of the characters say and do, but we know what they think and feel in the moments as the story moves forward. He does a great job of this. I'm going to keep reading just a little bit more. Well, said one of the lambs, this whole business is all well and good for Charlotte, but what about the rest of us? The smell is unbearable. Who wants to live in a barn that is perfumed with rotten egg? Don't worry, you'll get used to it, said Templeton. He sat up and piled, pulled wisely at his long whiskers, then crept away to pay a visit to the dump. When Lurvy showed up at lunchtime carrying a pail of food for Wilbur, he stopped short a few paces from the pig pen. He sniffed the air and made a face. What in thunder, he said, setting the pail down. He picked up the stick that Avery had dropped and pried the trough up. Rats, 
he said. Oh, phew, I might have known a rat would made it and make a nest under this trough. How I hate a rat. And Lurvy dragged Wilbur's trough across the yard and kicked some dirt into the rat's nest, burying the broken egg and all Templeton's other possessions. Then he picked up the pail. Wilbur stood in the trough, drooling with hunger. Lurvy poured. The slops ran down creamily around the pig's eyes and ears. Wilbur grunted. He gulped and sucked and gulped and sucked, making swishing and swashing noises, anxious to get everything at once. It was a delicious meal. Skim milk, wheat middlings, leftover pancakes, half of a donut, the rind of summer squash, two pieces of stale toast, a third of a ginger snap, a fishtail, one orange pail, several noodles from a noodle soup, the scum of a cup of cocoa, an ancient jelly roll, a strip of paper from the lining of the garbage pail, and a spoonful of raspberry jello. Wilbur ate heartily. He planned to leave half a noodle and a few drops of milk for Templeton. Then he remembered that the rat had been useful in saving Charlotte's life and that Charlotte was trying to save his life. So he left a whole noodle instead of a half. Now that the broken egg was buried, the air cleared and the barn smelled good again. The afternoon passed and evening came. Shadows lengthened. The cool and kindly breath of evening entered through doors and windows. Astride her web, Charlotte sat moodily eating a horsefly and thinking about the future. After a while, she bestirred herself. She descended to the center of the web and there began to cut some of her lines. She worked slowly but steadily while the other creatures drowsed. None of the others, not even the goose, noticed that she was at work. Deep in his soft bed, Wilbur snoozed. Over in their favorite corner, the goslings whistled a night song. Charlotte tore quite a section out of her web, leaving an open space in the middle. Then she started weaving something to take the place of the thread she had removed. When Templeton got back from the dump around midnight, the spider was still at work. So Mitchell Mustangs, it's important for us to identify and notice what point of view the author chooses to use to tell our stories. So as you're independently reading today, identify what point of view is this story written and why did the author choose this point of view? How does this particular point of view help me to be engaged in the book, help me to best understand what's taking place in the book and enjoy the book? So the last thing I want to say to you is to stay healthy, happy reading, happy writing, and thank you so much.